Well, I want to welcome you here. This is the first day of spring. How cool is that? Isn't it? Yeah. Wow. I am so glad you're with us for chapel today and for each of you coming, get a $2,000 gift certificate for the store of your choice. Wouldn't that be cool if we could do stuff like that? Wouldn't that be cool? Wow. Sorry, I don't have any gift certificates, but I'm glad you're here. And uh, today's chapel, we're going to continue our theme of peering around the bend. And we're going to talk about hanging in there when the going gets tough. So I'm glad you're here. I know this is a tough time of the semester. And I have a friend with me, Steve Shank, who is here. And Steve is representing Buffalo Mission Urban Partnership. There are 70 organizations that are on campus today to talk with you about employment and internships from three to five over in the Athletic Center. We invite you to be a part of that. I hope you'll take some time just to wander over and meet some of the people and hear opportunity. And Steve's gonna just give you a little bit idea of the ministry he's involved with and some of the opportunities that that ministry has for Robert students. So Steve, welcome, good to have you here. Give him a round of applause, would you? Well, I'm really happy to be here. This is my first time being on the Roberts Wesleyan campus, and uh, I'm glad to be here. So my name is Steve Shank. Um, I'm originally from California, but have been in Buffalo, New York for um, about 12, 13 years now. And is that for California or Buffalo? All right, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm from California, but I've been in Buffalo long enough that that's home for me. So um, I'll take that on behalf of the city of Buffalo. So uh, the Buffalo Urban Mission Partnership, what I'm here to talk to you about today is um, we offer paid ministry opportunities for people, paid ministry internships. So hopefully the paid part grabbed your attention, right? Um, it usually does. And we tell people that um, you'll make it through the year and you probably will have no savings at the end of the year, but you won't starve to death while you're with us. So it's, that's kind of the level of pay that we're offering. Um, but again, it's is that your organization's motto? You right. won't start to death while you're, while you're with us. That's right. good. That's, so that's, that's powerful. <laughs> um, so, uh, and we, we place people in lots of different kinds of ministry, um, ministry placement. So in churches, uh, worship leaders, youth pastors, church planting interns, but also in um, non, non for profits. So people are doing medical assistant work in uh, Christian, Christian Community Health Center. Um, people are doing IT work, communications work. So people are doing lots of different kinds of ministry in Christian organizations through us. Uh, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. But first, I wanted to share a little bit about Buffalo for those of you guys who don't know. So the next slide and the one after that. Um, Buffalo, I love Buffalo. And, um, you know, you said the, the theme of this morning's service is... Carrying some, around the bend. Uh, and, and, but also kind of like... And sticking with it. In, yeah, resiliency in, in difficult circumstances. And I think that's very much um, at the heart of what Buffalo is. Uh, it's a beautiful city and it's a broken city. And that's really everything about the city of Buffalo. So the infrastructure, there's beautiful buildings. Um, and, you know, we, my wife and I bought a house for $5,000 because of the blight that um, has struck our city. So mm. it's that beauty and brokenness. But also, even in terms of the people, you know, so I've had opportunities to our, our church. We've done worship services with other congregations where we're translating into three or four languages. And it's, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Um, so Buffalo is a very diverse city. There's culture from all over the world. We have, um, you know, on my block, there are people from 12 different countries where I live. So that's, that's beautiful. But at the same time, uh, it's one of the most segregated cities. Um, there's lots of brokenness. There's lots of poverty. Um, there are a lot of difficult things that people are struggling with, including, you know, the refugee community is just trying to figure out how to live in, our, in a new place. Um, and then, then in ministry, again, I get to hang out with people who should be making six figures or more in secular places. They're some of the most creative, intelligent people, and instead they're working for peanuts trying to solve some of the most difficult problems that our city faces, and I get to hang out with them and rub shoulders with them, which, I mean, that's beautiful, and yet the reason they're doing that is because there's real brokenness in yeah. our city that they're trying to, trying to deal with. So that's, that's Buffalo in a snapshot uh, and our program. So the next slide, there's basically three pieces to our program. Um, the first, you're missing the why on community there. That's my fault, not your tech person's fault. Um, but uh, community is a big part of what we do. So we actually have a, a rectory where everybody in our program lives together. And that's really significant and meaningful. Um, ministry can be lonely and so we wanna do it together. Uh, the second slide, um, we actually have a class where uh, it's not very academic, so you'll be done with your academics if you join us. It's really more a place of processing life and ministry in Buffalo. Um, and then the last, the, is the G is missing too, that's good. <laughs> I was like, what's so funny about class? All right, so 
the next slide. Um, the, and the, the next slide and the last, the last one is, um, and then the ministry component. So this is really the biggest piece of what you do. You would be putting in 35 hours a week working for, again, either a church or a nonprofit, um, you know, an urban farm or oh, uh, cool. any of the organizations that we connect with. Um, and we really, we really, we have a broad view of ministry. And so we would work with any of you who were interested to really place you in a, a ministry placement that is a good fit for who you are and where you want to go and what you believe God is calling you to do. Excellent. Excellent. So this afternoon, there again, three to five, if you want to find out more, Steve would love to talk with you. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to offer a prayer for our chapel. Right after the prayer is going to be a brief video that will give you an idea of Monday's chapel. Micah Bourne, who is a artist from Los Angeles, California is coming in to do Monday's Chapel. I think you'll find it very unique and different, and that will give you a little flavor of what Micah will be doing. But let's bow our heads. Let's just quiet our hearts for a moment and ask God to bless this time. Father, we come with a thousand and one things on our mind, and we want right now to be still before you and allow you to speak to us. We need to hear your voice this day. Bless this service. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Catch the screen. Thank you. I'm too wise for fortune cookies and horoscopes. I trust in the true God. But somehow, faith became superstition. The Bible, my crystal ball. Reading the scriptures like astrologers do the constellations hoping to see a glimpse of my future. Praying the Lord reveal his will for my life. Because if I make a right turn when I should have went left, who knows where I'll end up. And the person I was supposed to be will be wondering where I am. Who I am. Who am I? And who is this God I thought I worshipped? Hoping in the cross like a four-leaf clover, but the Lord proved not to be a lucky chunk. So what is true faith in the true God? My life is not what I thought it was, but I'm still not sure what it is. How did I get lost when I obeyed every instruction? This is not the journey I expected. I used to have dreams for my future, but I became so restless I couldn't sleep well enough to see them anymore. Only God knows what I've become. And he's the only one who needs to. After being misguided for so long, I realized I didn't need clearer directions, but a better destination. I became a slave in pursuit of greatness, but my Lord said the greatest pursuit servitude, and true worship extends beyond hymnals and pews. True faith works to love the ones it claims to save. It doesn't wait for future promises to be seen, but believes and labors for what it knows is coming. Peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. And that's something I'm capable of even now. Knowing I will be blessed as I trust God with the future I can never discern anything. So I devote this moment to serving people and not my destiny. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, good morning, everybody. Wow. Turn to your neighbor and say, you awake. You awake. Yeah. So uh, Micah will be with us on Monday. Do not miss that chapel. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, let's stand up together. Let's sing a few songs. Nothing can separate. Even if I ran away. Cheers. 
Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 13. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. In any case, I must keep going today and tomorrow and the next day, for no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is God's word for us today.
first time this past year, the diary of a young Jewish girl from the Second World War was published. It had been undiscovered until just recently. 700 pages of a diary kept by a girl beginning in 1939 through the summer of 1942. Her name was Rena Spiegel, and she lived in the Jewish ghetto of Warsaw, Poland. The diary, when you read it, reminds you of one of her contemporaries, who is more famous in our world, Anne Frank, who kept that marvelous diary while she and her family hid in Amsterdam. Rena's diary is delightful to read. In it, she tells humorous stories of times with her friends. She makes very beautiful observations about the world around her. She talks about her budding romance with her boyfriend. And she also talks about the horrible black cloud that was beginning to settle over her land. In July of 1942, she wrote her last entry. This is what this young girl wrote. My dear diary, my good, beloved friend, we've gone through such terrible times together, and now the worst moment is upon us. I could be afraid now, but the one who did not leave us will help us today. He'll save us. Hear, O Israel, save us, help us. You've kept me safe from bullets and bombs, from grenades. Help me survive. God, protect us all. God, into your hands I commit myself. I don't know what your response is to that final entry. I always marvel when I hear words from people who are determined with God's help to remain faithful and to press on. Whenever I hear stories, and I've heard them from some of you over conversations these past few years, of how God has helped you to be faithful in difficult situations. Six days after Rena penned that last entry, she and her family were executed, shot at 10.30 at night on July 31st, 1942. We need stories of determination and persistence, especially this time of semester, don't we? Where everything seems so heavy and at times overwhelming. My prayer this morning is that when I face my trials and when you face your trials, we will have that same kind of determination that that young Jewish girl had. To be able to say, God, I trust you and I commit 
my spirit into your hands. Ben did a beautiful job of reading a passage from Luke chapter 13. When Jesus gets word that Herod Antipas, the governor of the area of Galilee, has made threats against Jesus' life. And I marvel at Jesus' response when this powerful government official threatens him. Did you catch how he responded? Go tell that fox, Jesus said. Ben read that with a little attitude, which I liked. By the way, if you are ever in traffic court facing a judge, do not respond that way. Fox is a pejorative term. It is not a compliment. Go tell that fox. We're not sure what it means. In the Old Testament, foxes were nuanced animals. They were animals that stole and created habit, kind of like the squirrels in some of your backyards. In the New Testament era, in Greek literature, foxes were regarded as clever, mischievous kinds of animals. We even talk about that today, clever as a fox. But it's a pejorative term. Jesus is saying, go tell that fox. And then this is what he says. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. Jesus is determined to do what God has called him to do. It's repeated in Luke's Gospel. If we go back a couple of chapters to Luke 9, Jesus tells his disciples about what's going to happen. He warns them of the doom that's impending, that he will be crucified. And at that point, after telling them those words, it says in Luke 9, then Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He hung in there. That determination... That persistence. I think it's hard for us to realize just how determined Jesus was. How committed he was to continue his ministry and then make his way to Jerusalem. We have this idealized image of Jesus. We think of all the beautiful moments of his ministry. We need to remind ourselves that from the very start, Jesus faced an awful lot of trials and tribulations when he was born, his family had to flee for their lives, becoming illegal immigrants in Egypt. And throughout his life, there are people after him. It's hard to imagine what it must have been like for Jesus, the pressure he was under. There's a beautiful poem about the nativity of Christ, his birth, written by St. John of the Cross, who was a priest in Spain centuries ago. And in that beautiful poem, he has two lines that really intrigue me. He says, Upon Jesus' arrival, man gave forth a song of gladness. We celebrate. Jesus had come. But for God the Father, God gave a plaintive moan. God the Father groaned because he knew what he was sending his son into. The challenges Jesus faced. The trials he endured. We need to think about that in Lent. I don't know about you, but I so quickly want to move through Lent to Easter. Easter is just a little over 30 days away, and I love Easter Sunday and the sound of victory. I love celebrating Jesus' resurrection. But we need to feel Jesus' suffering as part of our preparation for Easter. I grew up in a Protestant church, which means at the front of the church we had a cross, and the cross was empty, and we were kind of smug as our, in our Protestant faith. And we would look down on our Catholic friends and say, we have it right. The crosses in our church are empty because Jesus has risen. The older I get, the more I appreciate my Catholic friends and what they view in their sanctuary. Because they are reminded regularly that Jesus, yes, rose, but he rose after suffering for us. 
That shapes how we look at our life. Rather than expecting our life to be easy, we should realize that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called also to endure, to persevere, to hang in there. Do you remember the first time you saw Mel Gibson's The Passion? I don't know about you, but I had a hard time watching that. And if you've never seen that movie, that might be great preparation for your Easter celebration. Because you see the suffering of Jesus and you realize the price that he paid, what he went through for our salvation. We need to feel the weight today of what Jesus endured. And that he was so determined, his love was so deep for us that he would not waver. He set his face resolutely towards Jerusalem. At one point, he said, no one who sets their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I don't know what your expectation is. My experience has taught me that life is difficult, that ministry is hard. It'd be interesting to have Steve share some of his experiences with Buffalo Urban Mission Project. My guess is there have been days you just wanted to quit. Throw in the towel. It's too hard. The problems are too great. This world has so much baggage. It's difficult. We want to live for the exciting moments. But God calls us to be faithful in the everyday. My senior year at college, I came across my favorite devotional book. It's by Oswald Chambers called My Utmost for His Highest. I still find myself turning to it. There's reflection on a passage in the Gospels where Jesus goes to the mountaintop and reveals his glory to three of his inner circle of disciples. He's transfigured. We call it the Mount of Transformation. You see Jesus in all his glory. And his disciples, Peter, James, and John, want to stay there. Who doesn't like to stay there in the glory moments? I love mountaintop experiences, but this is what Oswald Chambers says about the spiritual life. He says, the test of the spiritual life is the power to descend. If we have power to rise only, something is wrong. We're not built for the mountains. Those are for moments of inspiration. We're built for the valley. We're built for the ordinary stuff we are in, and that's where we have to prove our mettle. God calls you not to mountaintop experiences. God calls you to faithful discipleship. So how do we do that? How do we hang in there in the tough moments? Three things I have found. I hope they're helpful to you. The first is we begin with the end in mind. Those of you who have taken leadership in ministry with me know The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. This is habit number two in his list of seven. Begin with the end of mind. And what he means by that is you always keep before you your destination, where you're heading to. Jesus reminds us of our destination and where we're heading. There's an interesting passage in Luke chapter 10 where he tells his disciples who were so easily discouraged, let me tell you what I know. I saw Satan fall like lightning. Evil, he says, has already been defeated. I have given you authority, now catch the list here, to trample on snakes and scorpions. That's a beautiful thought, isn't it? and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Do you hear that last one? Don't get hung up on the snakes and scorpions. God has given you power to overcome the enemy. Nothing will harm you. We have the knowledge of how all this is going to end. This is not going to end in a bad way. <laughs> this is going to end in a glorious way. God is preparing 
the coming kingdom. And there will be a moment when we will stand and worship and sing before Jesus himself and the throne of God, and it will be awesome, and it will be incredible. And God will wipe away every tear from every eye. It's hard to imagine what it's going to be like, but keep the end in mind. There is something wonderful yet to come. And some days we forget that, don't we? We get so lost in the weight of everything we're carrying. If we're going to hang in there, we need to keep the end in mind. Here's the second thing I suggest to you. Whoops. I want to mention Greg Coles. I almost forgot. Do you remember Greg's when he was here? What a marvelous guy, graduate of Roberts, incredibly gifted Christian person, finishing up his PhD at, at Penn State University, recently passed his dissertation defense. Uh, Greg, I have great respect for. Greg revealed to me a few years ago that he is gay, and he wrestled with what it meant for him as a devoted follower of Jesus to be gay, what does he do with that? For Greg, this was his decision, was to live a life of celibacy. And I admire his willingness at huge cost to do what he feels God has called him to, to hang in there and to be faithful. He wrote a marvelous book. I hope you've read it. If you haven't, I recommend it recommended to you, Single Gay Christian. And at the end, he writes a letter to his 12-year-old self. And this is what he writes in that letter. Notice what he says. Jesus will cost you everything, and he'll be worth so much more than that. Just hold on. When nothing else makes sense, find a truth that refuses to move and hold on to it. I can't tell you every chapter of our story. I haven't read most of them for myself yet, but I've peeked ahead to the end of the book and I can tell you this, it's worth waiting for. What is Jesus calling you to sacrifice and endure because it's worth waiting for the coming kingdom? Here's the second thing. Rely on the Holy Spirit, not on your own grit. This is not about you being able to determine to work through things. This is about you allowing the Holy Spirit to fill your life. I have a dear friend who helps me to think about the Holy Spirit through the lens of a story from his childhood. His name is David, and David talks about the fact that he grew up as a kid visiting with his grandparents who lived on a farm in the Midwest in a big old drafty farmhouse. And in that big old drafty farmhouse on the third floor was an attic bedroom where they would sleep, he and a couple of his siblings in a big old iron frame bed. And he would go up on a winter's day to go to bed in that attic room and it would be so cold you could scrape frost off the bed frame. And he said he would get in bed shivering, his teeth chattering, and his grandmother would come and open up a box at the foot of the bed, an old chest, and she'd pull out a down quilted comforter. And with strong arms developed over years of farm work, she would snap that comforter out and it would settle over him. And he said, that's how I picture the Holy Spirit. Jesus said at one point to his disciples, I'm gonna to go to the Father, but he will send the comforter the advocate, the helper, the Holy Spirit. I want you to think of that today. That is God's presence in your life that can envelop you like a warm, beautiful blanket. Let the Holy Spirit sustain you and then let friends help you carry the load. This is not a solitary pursuit, this following Jesus. If you're going to hang in there, it's because you have friends that surround you. I love that Steve mentioned that at Bump, they live in community. You need to live in community when you're addressing the needs of the inner city of a city that's struggling. You need friends to surround you here right now and to give you empowerment. I love Lord of the Rings. Do you remember the story? Frodo has to take the ring, this evil ring, and return to the Mount of Doom, the ring, and throw it into the volcano. The fire will, will be melted because the ring corrupts anyone who holds it. 
And Frodo goes on a quest, and he goes on the quest with eight companions, and they fall away till at the very end, all that is left is his friend, his faithful gardener, Sam. And they're on the slope of Mount Doom, and the evil is so powerful, so overcoming, that Frodo is paralyzed. He can't move. He cannot get to the top to toss the ring into the fire. And Sam is there, and Sam cradles him. And I, I want to tell you what Sam says in those moments where it looks like the quest is going to be lost. Sam says to Frodo, Mr. Frodo, do you remember the Shire? It'll be spring soon, and the orchards will be in blossom, and the birds will be nesting in the hazel thicket, and they'll be sowing the summer barley in the lower fields, and eating the first of the strawberries with cream. Mr. Frodo, do you remember strawberries with cream? You see, Sam is trying to hold out what is to come. Someday we'll be back in the Shire, just like we as believers. Someday we'll be in the presence of Jesus with the kingdom fully realized. So Sam says to Frodo, remember where we're heading. And Frodo, paralyzed by the weight of evil, says, Sam, I can't remember. I can't recall the taste of food. I can't even... Think of the sound of water nor the touch of grass. I'm, I'm naked in the dark with nothing. All I can see is a wheel of fire before my waking eyes. And here's Sam, best line of the whole trilogy, Lord of the Rings. Sam says, then let's be rid of the ring, Mr. Frodo. Once and for all, come on, Mr. Frodo. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you. You know what I need? If I'm going to be faithful and hang in there, I need friends who will help carry me. You need friends too to help carry you. Let's pray and ask God to help us to be faithful. Father, I pray you'd go with my friends. Help them this day to not grow weary, to hang in there, to remain faithful and to press on. Bless them as they go. In the name of Christ, amen. Lord bless you as you go.